Good day everyone. Today we will be talking about C-reactive protein and acute phase reactants. Let's first start with acute phase reactants. So what are acute phase reactants? They are non-specific factors in the serum that are part of our natural or innate immunity. They can also be called your acute phase proteins. The reason why they are called acute phase is because they increase rapidly within 12 to 24 hours in response to stimuli. The increase of acute phase reactants must be at least 25%. Also, they decrease rapidly in the absence of stimuli. So they are acute phase because they increase rapidly and also decrease rapidly. Here are some notable examples of acute phase reactants. Some common ones include your C-reactive protein, serum amyloid A, complement proteins, mannose binding protein, fibrinogen, haptoglobin, ceruloplasmin, alpha-1 antitrypsin, and alpha-1 acid glycoprotein. How are acute phase reactants made? Whenever we encounter stimulus like infection, injury, or trauma to tissues, cells at the site of the stimulus, most notably monocytes and macrophages, produce our cytokines. These are chemical signals that travel across the body to stimulate an immune response. Some notable cytokines involved in acute phase reactant production are your interleukin 1 beta or IL 1 beta, interleukin 6 or IL 6, and your tumor necrosis factor alpha or TNF alpha. These cytokines travel through the bloodstream until they reach hepatocytes in the liver. And these hepatocytes are the ones responsible for the production of our acute phase reactants. Let's now go into more detail about our C-reactive protein, otherwise known as CRP. It is a trace constituent of serum having a normal concentration of 0.5 mg per deciliter or 5 mg per liter. The reason why it is called the C-reactive protein is that scientists in the 1930s thought that the C-reactive protein was an antibody to the C polysaccharide of your pneumococci or streptococcus pneumoniae. And because of that, that's why they call it the C-reactive protein because it reacted to the C polysaccharide. And now, we still use this name even though we know that it is no longer an antibody and it's in fact an acute phase reactant. So C-reactive protein levels increase rapidly within 4 to 6 hours up to 100 to 1,000 times the normal level, and they reach their peak value within 48 hours. Also, they decline rapidly with the cessation of stimulus with a plasma half-life of about 19 hours. This means that after the stimulus has disappeared, every 19 hours, the level of CRP in the blood decreases by about half. Some conditions that cause elevated CRP levels include bacterial infections, rheumatoid fever, and viral infections. These are examples of our acute infections. Also, for cancers or malignancies, we also see an increase in C-reactive protein levels. Chronic infections like tuberculosis can also cause an increase. And after damage to tissues, such as after a heart attack, inflammation is also known to increase the CRP level. In fact, average CRP levels are known to increase with age, which indicate subclinical inflammation. This means that as humans age, they normally develop inflammation at low levels, which do not necessarily exhibit any signs or symptoms. Let's now talk about the structure of our C-reactive protein. Its molecular weight is around 118,000 Daltons, and it has a pentameric structure, which means that it has five identical subunits held together by non-covalent bonds. In this figure, you can see the molecular structure of your CRP. Notice each of the individual monomers, of which there are a total of five. CRP is also a member of the pentraxins family, which are proteins with five subunits. Now what does the CRP do? It functions similar to antibodies in that it is capable of opsonization, precipitation, agglutination, and even complement activation in the classical pathway. 
Because of these functions, CRP is thought to act as a primitive non-specific antibody that attacks foreign antigens before the actual antibodies can be produced. One way that CRP differs from antibodies is its binding capabilities. CRP binding is calcium dependent and non-specific, which means that it can bind to a number of different substrates compared to our antibody, which can only bind to one specific epitope. The main substrate of CRP is your phosphocholine, and this is a compound that is commonly found on many microbial membranes. Other substrates of CRP include small ribonuclear proteins, phospholipids, peptidoglycans, and other constituents of bacteria, fungi, and parasites. CRP can also bind to specific receptors found on monocytes, macrophages, and neutrophils, and this allows it to promote phagocytosis. In this figure, you can see the mechanism of CRP binding. This is your CRP molecule here, and notice that calcium has to first attach itself to the calcium receptor before CRP can bind to its substrate. In this example, you can see the phosphocholine receptor bind to the phosphocholine, which is normally found on bacterial cell membranes. In the clinical laboratory, we often conduct CRP testing for the following uses. First, for disease process tracking, in which CRP levels are increased as the disease is ongoing and decrease as the disease resolves. It can also be used for inflammation and infection treatment response monitoring, in which CRP levels are found to decrease when our treatment is working. For cancer surveillance, an increase in CRP level may mean that the cancer has resurfaced or that it has metastasized. Also, for transplant monitoring, an increase in CRP may indicate that the patient is beginning to reject the transplant. For these different uses, we use automated nephrometry tests, which are sensitive up to 0.01 milligrams per deciliter. Here is an example of an automated CRP machine. In recent years, CRP is now being used for monitoring heart disease. High CRP levels are found to be a significant risk factor for myocardial infarctions or heart attacks and ischemic stroke. This is even true for patients with no previous history of cardiovascular disease. The normal range of CRP for cardiac monitoring is 0.47 to 1.43 mg per liter with an average of 0.87 mg per liter in adults. Here are some values showing the risk factors involved with CRP. Less than 1 mg of CRP per liter indicates a low risk for heart disease, 1 to 3 mg per liter is an average risk, and greater than 3 mg per liter of CRP puts an individual at high risk for cardiovascular disease. One of the most simple and cost-effective ways to test for CRP is the CRP rapid latex agglutination test. This is usually used in primary hospitals and laboratories. For the test principle, it uses a reverse passive agglutination in which polystyrene latex particles are coated with antibodies to human CRP. When mixed with serum containing CRP levels, clear agglutination is seen within two minutes. So in this example, you have your C-reactive protein, which is found in the patient's serum, and you mix it with the latex particles coated with anti-human CRP. When they interact with each other, there is sensitization, followed by the formation of cross-linkages, which result in visible agglutination. The CRP rapid latex agglutination test is usually done on a glass slide. For the reagents of this test, we have first our CRP reagent, which is a uniform suspension of polystyrene latex particles coated with anti-CRP antibodies. Most modern tests use monoclonal IgG in their CRP reagent. Their agent is usually standardized to detect concentrations greater than 0.6 mg per deciliter, but this can change from manufacturer to manufacturer. That's why you have to check the kit and product information for the sensitivity of whatever reagent you are using. However, common to all reagents are your positive control and your negative control. The positive control is a substance that is reactive with CRP, usually 
This is pooled serum from actual patients and your negative control, which is non-reactive with the CRP reagent. Now for the patient preparation and test sample for the procedure, no special preparation of the patient is required prior to collection by approved techniques. This means that you can collect blood from the patient at any time of the day as long as it is via venipuncture or capillary puncture. Between the two though, venipuncture is always preferred over capillary puncture. For the sample, use non-heat inactivated serum for the testing. This is because heating the serum will also deactivate our CRP. Should a delay in testing occur, you can store the samples at 2 to 8 degrees Celsius or at refrigerator temperature for up to 7 days. Also, if you notice that your sample is markedly lipemic, hemolyzed, or contaminated with other cellular elements, you should avoid using those because they can produce non-specific results. Also, if you use plasma instead of serum, this can also lead to false positive results. There are two ways we can use the CRP rapid latex agglutination test. First is via a qualitative method. This means that we can only detect the presence or the absence of CRP, but we cannot know for sure the true amount of CRP in the patient's sample. For this procedure, pipette one drop or 50 microliters of serum on the reaction card or slide. Then add one drop of CRP latex reagent to the drop of test serum on the slide and make sure that the dropper tip does not touch the sample to avoid contamination. Using a mixing stick provided in the kit, mix the serum and CRP latex reagent uniformly over the entire circle, then immediately start a stopwatch. Rock the slides gently back and forth, observing for agglutination macroscopically within two minutes. If you have a slide agitator, you may also use that at 100 RPM for two minutes. Next, we have the semi-quantitative method. In this method, we are able to characterize or estimate the CRP levels in a patient's sample. For the procedure, using isotonic saline, prepare serial dilutions of the serum sample from 1 is to 2, 1 is to 4, 1 is to 8, 1 is to 16, 1 is to 32, and 1 is to 64, and so on. Starting with the 1 is to 2 dilution, pipette one drop or 50 microliters of the sample onto the slide and add one drop of your CRP reagent and mix. Spread the mixture uniformly over the entire circle and start your stopwatch. Rock the slide gently back and forth, observing for agglutination within two minutes. So proceed similarly with each dilution and make sure that you do not read the results beyond two minutes. You will continue to do this with each dilution until you reach a negative result. So what do you expect in a CRP latex agglutination test? So if CRP is greater than 0.6 milligrams per deciliter or 6 milligrams per liter, a visible agglutination is observed. If the CRP concentration is less than 0.6 milligrams per deciliter, then no agglutination is observed. This is an example of a black glass slide in which you perform the CRP test. This is your positive result where you can see visible agglutination with the naked eye. Here are your negative results which just show the latex suspension without any aggregates. Please take note that for some manufacturers, the sensitivity may be higher than 0.6 mg per deciliter. So again, it is always a good idea to read the product insert before performing the test. Let's now talk about reporting our test results. For the qualitative method, agglutination is a positive test result and indicates the presence of CRP in the test specimen. No agglutination is a negative test result and indicates the absence of CRP in our test specimen. In order for us to have a positive result, our test specimen has to be positive, our positive control has to be positive, and our negative control has to be negative. In case you see a negative test result for your positive control or a positive test result for your negative control, you have to invalidate your test and check your reagents because there might be something wrong with them. For reporting, we report positive reactions as positive or greater than or equal to 6 
mg per deciliter CRP or 6 mg per liter CRP. For negative test results, we report it as less than 0.6 mg per deciliter CRP or less than 6 mg per deciliter of CRP. Again, this value might change depending on the sensitivity of the test kit you are using. For semi-quantitative methods, agglutination in the highest serum dilution corresponds to the amount of CRP in milligrams per deciliter present in the specimen. The concentration of CRP in milligrams per deciliter can be calculated as follows. That is, CRP is equal to 0.6 times the dilution factor. For example, if you used a 1 is to 4 dilution, then your dilution factor will be 4. D here is the highest dilution of serum showing the agglutination, otherwise known as your titer. In this table, you can see a short guide in reporting your CRP using the semi-quantitative method. For example, if you have a positive reaction in the 1 is to 2 dilution, then report it as 1.2 mg per deciliter or 12 mg per liter. If you have a positive result in the 1 is to 16 dilution, you can report that as 9.6 mg per deciliter or 96 mg per liter. Make sure to check out our CRP test demonstration video and these references in case you want to do some further reading. Thank you for listening and we'll see you in the next lecture.